Hello everybody, my name is Adam Stevens and welcome back to the Splinter Studios podcast. So first of all, I feel the need to apologise for the, the lack of uploads and the lack of podcasts. It's been a bit of a, a mental couple of months really with, with COVID coming and going. We've been gigging again, we've been on tour, which meant practising. And another reason for the, the lack of uploads is just been because of, of today's guest really, not blaming him, but... Uh, We've been doing, I've been working on an audio book. I've been recording the audio for Andy Flute's book, Jesus in My Corner, which I've got a copy of right here. If you're watching the video, you can see it. Uh, Andy's today's guest, and I've just finished my chat with him, and uh, it's it's blown my mind a little bit. He's such an interesting guy. His story's fascinating. Obviously, I've been reading his book, um, and I'm not, I'm not a big reader, I'll be honest. I should, I know that I should. But I'm not a big reader. I've just got such a short attention span. It's a bit of a, a drummer's curse. But the book is brilliant. It's captured me all the way through. He, he writes in... It's it's all written by Andy. There's no ghostwriter, which I think is really important. Uh, it's full of his own, like, colloquialisms, if I've said that right. And you can almost read it in his voice. And I think by listening to the podcast first, you get a bit of a sense about Andy. You can hear a bit about him and hear how he talks. And then you can, if you read the book afterwards, you'll you'll understand what I'm saying. It, you can read it in his own words. But if you don't want to, soon to be available, there'll be the audiobook version, which is narrated by yours truly. So in today's podcast, we delve a lot deeper than we have in, in previous episodes. And to be fair, probably more than what I will do in future ones. The, the story is really fascinating, and I, I found that it... it it's got these three chapters. It's got his boxing career, which he sparred the likes of Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, Joe Calzaghe. He says 11 world champions, which is just absolutely incredible. Uh, and then throughout his boxing career, he finds addiction in alcohol and drugs, which completely ruins his life. And then to drag him out of that darkness, he finds religion and God plucks him out and, and saves his life. And he's using that word now to spread the word of God. And it, it's just fascinating. Now, maybe you like myself, and I, and one of the reasons I found it so interesting is because I think I'm completely opposite to Andy. Um, I've, <laughs> I'm so far from a boxer. I've never been punched in my life. I've never been in a fight. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big drinker. I, I, I've never touched a drug in my life. It's not something that interests me. And I'm, um, to be honest, I'm not religious. So to hear Andy talk about all three things, I just found so fascinating. And it's just like the complete opposite life to, to mine. So to be able to ask him questions and understand why he's done what he's done and how he's lived his life, it's just been a real eye opener. So I hope you find it as interesting as I did. Uh, please give it a listen. Uh, we're on YouTube if you're listening on the app or we're on the podcast app on all the usual places. Um, but yeah, thank you. And in advance, if you want to check out Andy's book, uh, you can pick up a copy. Uh, you can find him on all the usual places on Facebook. If you want to search him on Instagram, his username is Flute Andy, and he's also got a website which is www.jesusinmycornerministry.com. And I recommend checking all that out. He's an absolutely great guy. And also, I think this is 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 the perfect person if you know anybody who's kind of in that those dire straits who's really stuck and they need help. I think he can be a real inspiration. He loves doing it. I can see it in his eyes when he's talking. He absolutely loves saving people, and he's doing that on a day-to-day basis. So go and check him out. I think he's fascinating. So give the chat a listen, and uh, yeah, please enjoy. So Andy, thank you for for joining me. Um, recently finished reading your book, Jesus in My Corner, which uh, I've already said to you is a just fascinating, fascinating read. You've got a really interesting story. Um, so it, it kind of mixes the, your life of boxing and then finding addiction and then coming through that to find religion. Um, so the first thing I want to know really is before boxing, what was in your life? What what was your life like before you started fighting? 
Well, boxing's always been in my life, to be honest, because I went to the gym when I was three. So, uh, it's always been in me, in 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 my life, sort of thing. Yeah. Like, my dad was a boxer. My brother was a boxer. My uncle was a boxer. Um, I can't really remember um, without boxing, to be honest. So that's it's just always been. It's always been part of my life from when I, from as young as I can remember. Because obviously I went to the gym when I was three or four years of age. Yeah. So it's always been part of me who I am. Yeah. So because I, I said to you earlier, I said one of the things that re- I find really interesting with the book is I'm complete opposite. I've never never had a fight in my life. I've never took a punch. So the fact that you did that as a as a career and you've been punched by some of the most hardest hardest hitting people ever. What what's that like? What's that feeling inside you that makes you want to keep going to training every day and getting punched in the face? Well, boxing was um uh, for me it was just something I, I wanted to do like, you know, I just wanted to to be the best at it. Um I you know, I really enjoyed the training, I really enjoyed the the boxing side of things. Um, obviously, nobody likes being hit, but it just comes part of what what you're doing. Yeah. And you have to just learn to be able to just shrug it, shrug, shrug it off. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's it, really. I mean, you know, I was lucky enough that I had a good a good chin, and I had a chin of granite. Yeah. And uh, nobody could really. I never was, was never knocked out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, so you know, but that just comes with part of being a boxer. Um, you know, I mean, this story is a boxer's journey. Uh, from hell to Christianity, and it is and it is a journey because I've boxed nearly all my life, yeah. um, and um, I mean from the age of eleven to I was thirty, I don't think I had a season off. Really? Yeah, I don't have a season a season off. So your first fight was at eleven. I was eleven years of age, um, and I boxed at the Park Hall in Wolverhampton. Yeah. I boxed a kid named Paul Flood. He had five, won four, and uh, I was too good for him. I beat him. Yeah, because you had a really good amateur career, didn't you? Yeah, I, you know, I had a good amateur career. I could have done uh, like anything, like better, if um, you know. But uh, I was quite happy with it, to be honest. You know, it was all right. Yeah. You know, it's quite good to win titles as am- amateurs and then box for England and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it's it's it's, it's good. You know, so yeah, it was a, a, a decent amateur career. I, I wish I'd have gone to the Olympics though now because I was picked to get to the Olympics uh, and I didn't go. Was that Barcelona? Yeah, and I never went. Uh, Peter Blankin, sop from the Midland Counties IBA, picked me and says says I was going. Um, but obviously, I boxed for England a few times then, and I was, um, I was, I was like, well, there was no Sport England then or or anything like that. Yeah. There was no funding. Uh, and all I was doing was getting a pat on the back and I was boxing the best people in the world for nothing. Yeah. And I thought, well, I might as well get professional. Yeah. And I remember once having to get my own train fare from Crystal Palace to to, 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 to train. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I thought, well, they say we're heavy. There's an interesting story in the book. I think it was from your, your amateurs when they, your your coaches and your trainers, they were saying, this one guy that you're fighting, not to go and knock him out. And then you were like, remembered something your dad had said. And go yeah. and just go out there and, and clean him out, and that's yeah, what you did. Yeah, I, I, I remember the England coach telling me um, against the, yeah, Germany um, to go to go out and feel him out in the, in the first round, and don't throw all your aces was his words. Really? His words was don't throw all your aces. Yeah. Uh, but before I left, my dad told me to hit him hard in the first round and let him because I'm a strong puncher, and he said let him feel feel your power. Yeah. And I looked across the ring at him, and he did look like as strong as me. He was taller than me, and I thought, well, I'm going to put it on him and hurt him. And that's what I did. I shot out the first round, and uh, I hit him as hard as I could, and I stopped him in the first round. Yeah. Uh, but if I'd have listened to the England coach, I'd, I'd have probably let him in the fight, and I could have had a harder fight. But yeah. I, I brought a dead game chance. Were they three three rounds? Three three minute rounds. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard, isn't it, because you've got a you've got a win two of them rounds if you're not. Yeah, stopping yeah. Them, when he was a, he was a, he was a good good lad. He was captain of their their team as well. Yeah. I mean, he was like German champion. Yeah. But I blasted him away, man. I gave him a chance. Yeah. You know I mean? So you captained England, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Throughout a lot of the yeah, yeah. the amateur side, and then. Had the opportunity to go to the Olympics. Do you think you could have walked away with a, a medal? I, d- I don't know. I can't say that. You know, I was up there with the, the elite uh, middleweights, so I was strong. Um, I could have done. I don't know. I don't know. We'll never know that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know. So you turned pro at what age were you? Um, just got nineteen. Right. Still a middleweight. Stayed yeah, middleweight yeah. as a pro. Mm. So he was de- decent size, even from, mm. from a relatively young age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah still to be a middleweight. Yeah. And. You you were middleweight at a time when it was like one of the best 
yeah. best weight to be in, wasn't there? And it's some of it, even to today, like you look at careers mm. of different weights in boxing, it, that was like the pinnacle almost of, of British boxing. So you were middleweight at a time of you've got Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, Steve Collins, Joe Calzaghe. So those were, were like headlining shows around the country and around the world, I suppose. And you're kind of coming in, into that mix. So what was the first differences really that you noticed from amateur to pro? Uh, the longer rounds, um, that was the first difference. Yeah. Um, but the training and everything else um, wore really that much. Just We were just trained a little bit harder, a little bit longer. Um, and obviously my body was still developing from a from a into a man because you're not a man till you're like past 21 yeah. and uh, I was still young but I was like very 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 strong you know I was very strong for my age and my size I mean when I was like 17 I was fighting men yeah. you know and I was beating men you know what I mean but so but the difference from an amateur to a professional is is some top amateurs don't make good professionals and some you know it's just it just depends if you can adapt to the the, the longer rounds and were you more suited do you think to be yeah no, I was suited more to it yeah because you, know. you being durable yeah in three minute rounds there, there isn't as many knockouts yeah. is there but if you if you then yeah. go in over 12 but um the only thing what noticed for me what was the thing for me was because when i started cele- um, when i started after me england victories um I started celebrating with alcohol, with drink. Right. And I never drank, um, really, only till I was old enough to, like, you yeah. know, till you know, till I started celebrating. And what, what one of the big differences for me for becoming amateur to professional was that I never cut as an amateur in over 100 fights. Yeah. And then when I was old enough to drink and started drinking and then turned professional, I started cutting. So whether that anything had anything to do with my blood or my skin or anything else like that, but I never cut a temperature, and, then, yeah. and then it really hampered my professional career. Up. Yeah, yeah. You talk about a lot, a lot of that in your book that there were fights that you were losing that you shouldn't have lost just because you got a cut, and then there were other times where the referee just kind of ignored the cut and it wasn't an issue. Yeah. But there's that inconsistency throughout, and it it does hamper your career, doesn't it? As you, yeah, as because, you went along. yeah, because you got to. You, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't believe in the rules. I think they should be changed. I think if after three rounds, if you have a cut, then the points should be added up yeah. or, be, or declared a no contest. I mean, the one fight I had was in, I'd lost in, um, in sixty seconds. You know, the fight should have been declared a no contest. But instead of that, I had to, I had to have a loss and then build back up. So the cut was within sixty seconds, yeah, and, they, one, and they, that was a loss. Yeah, to and you it was then. a clash of heads as well, and it was a loss to me because you've had to pull out. Because they couldn't carry it. Well, the referee stopped it. Well, a clash, unless it's... I'm assuming yeah. it was an accidental clash of yeah, heads. it was an accident, yeah. So then that's... It, you, yeah. It's equally... It's your unlucky... Yeah. It's it's your... It's not your fault, obviously, but the yeah. fact that you're the one that's cut. Yeah, but that's the way it is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it is. That's, that's mm. disappointing, it? should be a change of the rules, to be honest. That should have been an out contest. And within boxing... A loss is a lot worse than a lot of other sports. If you look at football, like teams yeah, lose yeah. every week, whereas you know, in boxing, you have a loss. You got to build your, another, get another couple of wins to build back up. Well, see, if you look at Floyd Mayweather, his whole career was on not losing, mm. and that it's keeping that O next to the record, mm. and it, it doesn't define a lot of fights. Like we look nowadays at people like Ant- Anthony Joshua, who's probably the biggest global superstar in boxing, and he's got two losses now. Mm. But I think Luke getting that first loss is a big deal, isn't it? And uh, so, how did you feel when you first tasted? I was devastated. Food? Really? Yeah, honest, honestly, I was devastated. I was, I was angry, and I was devastated. I was, I was sad. I was emotional. I was, you know. But then I just thought I'll come back better. You know, but that happened to me a few times. You know, it really hampered my career. Cuts did, but you know, you know, you could just cry over spilt milk. You just gotta dust yourself down and get back on with things. Yeah, you know. And your dad was your trainer, wasn't he? Yeah. Throughout. Was it for your entire yeah, career? Yeah, my dad was my trainer from from um, from an amateur all the way through to a professional because you need somebody in your corner who knows you. Yeah. You know, and I could always trust my dad better than I could trust anybody else. How did you find that dynamic of, y- of your dad? Because yeah. it must be hard for him because he's having to watch you take punishment yeah, yeah, every yeah. single fight and he's yeah. got to make the decisions that... Yeah. Your dad's never going to want to pull you out of the no. fight because he, he knows how, mm. how tough you are, but he's yeah. also got to make decisions that's yeah. right for you, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you find that with him? Um, the, I remember the one fight, they couldn't control the bleeding in me, um, in, around my eyes, and they wanted to pull me out. And I said to him, you better not pull me out, I'll never speak to you again. <laughs> and I, after the fight, 
I had seven stitches in the one eye and nine in the other. Yeah. But I managed to uh, get the distance and get a draw. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you would you have done it again if you had your time over? You'd yeah, yeah, of course I would. Yeah, like Joe Kozaki with his dad as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? He had a good partnership as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But obviously we went different ways. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a there's a lot now, I suppose, that, that do have their, their yeah. dads or family. Yeah, there's quite a few. Me, I mean, me and my dad boxed on the same night as well. There are yeah. many, many ever done that. No way. Yeah, yeah. Me and my dad boxed on the same night as amateur. I boxed um, Alan Gandhi from Droit, which he was national champion. My dad boxed Paul Makedovich from uh, from Worcester, who was Midland champion. Yeah. We, we both won on the same night. So I find it fascinating to remember all these names, because you've, mm-hmm. you've got all... The, you, you talk about it in your book, and I thought... Like, I, with me, I've I've played hundreds and thousands of gigs. Yeah. I can't remember where I've played or when it was, whereas you almost seem to remember where you were, who it was. Yeah. And these people ain't necessarily gone on to be famous boxers, yeah. but you still, is it just something that the it's, name stick with? It's just, I don't know, I, I ain't quite punch drunk yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're all right this far, I think you'll be all right. So, you were, I suppose in terms of boxing, some of the most famous names that you come across was from sparring. Yeah. So you... You were hired as a sparring partner for for Chris Eubank. Mm. What was that like? That was an amazing job, to be honest. But I'll tell you, it, it was hard, 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 really, really hard. Yeah. And I think being a sparring partner is worse than fighting them because I had to do it every day. Yeah, yeah. And Chris Eubank used to try and knock all his sparring partners out. And most there was lots getting sent home. There was champions coming down to the Brighton getting sent home. But with me, he couldn't do it to me. And I could, I could, I'm known for my toughness. Yeah. And I get him as much as he give me, and I've done over 200 rounds with him. Which I suppose is why he kept on. Yeah, that, why you he were kept a good it, investment. Why he you? kept on employing me. And he also thanked me alive as well after one of his fights. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that clip. I have seen that now. I'll show it you after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, he, he, I, I gained a lot from it. Um, you know, it was a great experience as well. And then Barry Hearn from Matchroom, Eddie Hearn's dad, yeah, yeah. he came to the gym to watch me spar because Chris had told him I was his best sparring partner he'd ever had. Yeah. And he said, I'll take his place as a world champion when Chris retires. Yeah. Um, and I did sign with Ian, um and I had a good contract all in place. But uh, obviously it didn't get to plan because of the lifestyle that I led. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that that fascinates me. I'm I'm a massive Eddie Hearn fanboy. Yeah. He's like a, as a small business owner, I really look up to him. And obviously, his dad yeah. laid the path out. Barry was Barry, well. Barry's the one, ain't he? Yeah. Barry was like he got like a silver spoon in his mouth, like his silver tongue. You know, and he was great. And, like, and you know, he 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 said to me, "I'll make you world champion, Andy. I'll yeah, make yeah. you a multi millionaire." And, uh, and I believed him, and he would have done it. Yeah. But I did to my end of the deal. So you that know. was. Do you think that was your fault then? That was down. Yeah, to yeah you. it was his fault. It was my fault. Because, because, you, because of my lifestyle. Because he come to you, didn't he? And he says, yeah. Chris is coming to the end of his career. Yeah. It's your chance to step up now yeah. and you yeah. can be the world champion. We'll take you around. Because he, he took you back on a world tour, didn't he? And yeah, well, places. I was his main sparring partner for all the most of them fights. Yeah, and, and that was your... Yeah. And that, how old were you at this point? About 25. So you've still got the best of your career mm-hmm. to come, out, not you? And yeah. then potentially, yeah. you're looking that thinking, that's going to be me headlining all of these mm-hmm. arenas around the world. Mm-hmm. And the millions of pounds that can come with it, and you look at Eubank, it's a massive personality. Mm. What's that pressure like? Well, it did give me pressure. It gave me um, added confidence and a bit of arrogance. Um, and I thought I'd made it before I'd actually made it. Um, I was young, and um, you know, and I was just I thought I've done it now. I've made it. I've got on here. Yeah, but I hadn't really done it. If you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. It made me a bit co- too cocksure of myself. Yeah. Um, but obviously, uh, my addictions and everything else um, got the better of me. Instead of um, you know, instead of reaching my potential, which which I never did, but you know, that's life. So I, I kind of get the impression with the book that sometimes you you were better as the underdog when you were almost when you weren't supposed to win mm. and you were fighting your way up. Mm. That maybe when Barry Earn comes calling and goes, "Here's a load of money. I'm going to make you a star," that you go, "Right, I've got this cracked." And you can take your foot off the gas, and that's when you can go and disappear down the pub a bit because it's there for you. The, you've already made it. Is that is that the case? Do you think or? a little bit? Yeah, a little bit did. A little bit did. But I never stopped. I never stopped drinking from yeah. the, from, from 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 what happened was from when I start when I when I finished boxing for England. When I was kept when I was boxing for England, I got the taste for alcohol, and then really my drinking career was taking off as my boxing career was taking off. Yeah, and the two went hand in hand. Yeah, and I dated one without the other. Yeah. And all the sparring jobs I went on, I drank every single night. I'd have a night off. And uh, all my fights, I drank all the way through as well. 
And um, you know, I don't advise anybody to do that sort of stuff because it's it's wrong. Yeah. But it's what I did, and I I liked to drink, and I was young and strong, and I thought I could do both. Yeah. And I did do both, and I did manage to do well doing both. But like, obviously, to get to the top level, um, you know, it, and then he caught up with me. Yeah. You know, and I probably was cutting because of me drinking as well. Because like I said, I never cut as amateur. And yeah. then, I, then I'm professional, and I'm sorry, cutting because I'm you, drinking. You talked about you go over to Spa. Is it uh, the Spanish? Champion or Spanish? Well, yeah, that was later on in my career. That, that was. was. Yeah. And you were you were going out. Nine, then. You were going out, sparring in the day, drinking in the night, and then you'd have to go and run down. Was it mm. the pier or the beach? Well, that was Eubank as well. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. I used to go out every single night, and I used to run. To, uh, I used to run to the pier in the morning from the hotel. It was two more there, two more back, and uh, have a shower um, and have a breakfast, get and go to bed, and, <clears throat> and then spar at three o'clock. But I always managed to spar well. Even were you, did you get bad angle? Yeah, no, I was like over sparring with him as well, but like because I feared him as well, and he punched that hard that you had to be on your game, like yeah. you know what I mean. And um, but it, it, you know, I was never in any trouble, and he tried his hardest to knock me out in sparring, and he couldn't. He even asked me to, he even asked me to, he looked at my elbows because he was eating, he, was, he was knocking his hands up on my elbows, but I took everything, most of it, on my elbows and my gloves, you know what I mean. But that comes through experience. Yeah, and so. It, what age were you when you started getting that taste for drink then? From from the from boxing for England, about 16, really? 17. So, as, yeah. so your entire professional career then? Yeah, you know? it's mixed with drink. Yeah. You know, I don't I'd make excuses, but it's the truth. Yeah. You know? So you, you do talk about it a bit in the book. You you did dabble with drugs as well, but was it yeah. predominantly the drink? It just went hand in hand, but the drink was more poison to start with because yeah. when I, then when I was drunk, then, like me, me, then when my guard was down, I'd... Um, I'd, I'd I'd take drugs right. as well, and I'd take anything to be honest. Yeah, I was like a you know like an animal, could get enough. Yeah, anything. And you yeah. said that you weren't you you didn't even have like a favourite drink. You would just drink anything. Yeah, you like I'd the taste of, of it all. Yeah, I'd drink anything. And it, that, that's all. Most dangerous because it's like the, what it did for me. Yeah, the feeling it gave me. As soon as I started to drink and the feeling I got from it, I thought, wow, I like this feeling. Yeah, you know what I mean. I never intended to be an alcoholic, but that's what comes with keep on drinking. Yeah. Nobody sets out to become an alcoholic, but but by keeping on drinking, your body has a psychological change. Yeah, and, and um, you know, you, there's no operation in the world that can change it. And you also, in the middle of the, of your career, you bought a pub. Yeah, which I imagine doesn't help no. a man with addiction. Did you know you were addicted at that point? No, I thought it, no, I, I was like a binge drinker then, mm. and um, I just had a couple of good wins as well, and I should have had another total fight. Yeah. you know, but um. I, and I don't. And I went to spot with Joe Kozaki while I'd got the pub as well. You know what I mean? And uh, all the other things. But it don't help. It don't help things. You know, it's an occupational hazard as well, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like it, it does hamper your career throughout, doesn't it? And was it just this thing that you, you just couldn't shift? It was just every time. It was, it, I suppose it was a daily thing, wasn't it? Drinking yeah. ev- every yeah. day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd train in the morning. Like I said, I'll spar with whatever I gotta do, and then I was at a drink at night. Yeah, like it was just the norm, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just just normal. So, but you still, regardless of that, you still managed to have a, an amazing mm-hmm. boxing career, didn't you? It wasn't to the extent that you probably could have done, and the, the drink and the cuts held mm-hmm. you back. And, and like you say, those two might have gone hand in hand. That the drinking thins your blood or your skin or whatever it was that. Meant you kept on, on cutting, but you still, you you fought for some titles, didn't you? And mm. and and like I say, you you sparred with Eubank. Did you spar with Nigel Ben? Yeah, I sparred with Nigel Ben before Eubank. Oh, did you? Yeah, I sparred with Nigel Ben when I was twenty two, nineteen ninety two, when he was boxing in Italy for his world title. Yeah, and that's when Jimmy Tibbs said to me that God would use me one day. Yeah. And uh, I just laughed at him and never thought nothing about it. Yeah. You know I mean? But it turned out to be true. Yeah. And then I sparred with Chris. I sparred with. Um, I went toe to toe with eleven world champions all together. Really? Yeah. All, all together. And yeah. is the one that stands out as being the best? The best. Um, there was all the top three: of Nigel, Ben, Chris Eubank, and Joe Kalzaki. Yeah. Um, the others they didn't bother me at all. Yeah. I, you know, some of them I ain't gonna, but they didn't bother me at all. Really? I, I held me on more than more than more more. You know, I held back a couple of times to make yeah. it easier for me. You know what I mean? But the the top three: Chris Eubank, Joe Kalzaki. And Nigel Ben and I find Joe Kalzaki the most awkward, probably because of his stance. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, do you, you think? Obviously, I know those three are, are exceptional, but you could have, if the others didn't trouble you, you could have gone on and won yeah, a the world others, title. I, I, you? I, honestly, the others won't bother. They don't bother me at all. Yeah, 
I mean, sometimes I had the better of them. You know I, mean? I knocked one of them out. Really? Yeah. So, so w- w- do you think you performed better in sparring than you did on fight night? Yeah, 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 I did. Because I never had to... See, what I did, because I never lived right. Um, I always had to lose weight before a fight. So I never got in the ring at my full strength. But while I was being a sparring partner, I was walking around and I had to make a weight. Yeah. So, I was, so, I was, so I was strung. Yeah. So I was all, all better in sparring than what I was. Because I did live right. And I had to make the weight for a fight. I, yeah. I dragged the weight down. Like when I fought for the British middleweight title against Neville Brown, I run five mile in the morning before a fought him. Yeah. And that was because and the weigh was on the same day. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. So I had to fight him the night after. Now, now they changed that rule to the way in the day before. Yeah. You know, if, they'd won, if that rule had been in effect when I fought him, I reckon I'd have won him. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt, the, the result would have been different anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? It must be frustrating though, because you're you're cleaning these people out in sparring. You've got world class experience of sparring, yet on on the big night there was just something that, whether it was luck or or not, that it just wasn't translated. It's because you've the, got that opportunity, the build up to the fight, so they are they do, you know we can be making the weights because they do it right. Yeah, and obviously having to train before fights to make the weight was taking my strength away from me. Where was I was just, when I was a sparring partner, I'd had to, I'd had, I was I was strong all the time. Yeah, that's why I could hold me on with all the best. Cause yeah, I was yeah, strong. So out of do you, do you rate Nigel Ben top out of those? So Eubank Ben Kalzaki. I'd, I'd say Kalzaki to be honest. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, ben and Eubank come on par with each other. Yeah. Um, Nigel's a bit. A bit harder puncher than Eubank, but he's not a stronger man. Yeah. Um, Chris is a stronger guy. His bodily strength and his in his punch resistance is a lot better. Yeah. But Nigel's a one punch hitter. Uh, well, more. You had a really interesting story in the book. How later on you did an exhibition about with Nigel Ben, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And he got wind that you were well. He didn't get wind because someone told him you were going to yeah. knock him out or going to try and knock him out. Yeah. Which that t- wasn't true, was it? No, it wasn't true. Now. So then he's he's full of anger, going, "This bloke's going to try and embarrass me." Yeah. On an exhibition where there is no knockouts, mm. so he tried to clean you out, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He really did. He really. I went to the middle of the ring with him, and he said, "I've heard everything you've said about me," and looked at me in the face and banged my gloves. You know what I mean. And um, it was a good time for me because I was still drinking and drugging it and I was going through a divorce and it was probably one of the worst times for this me. Was later, this was after you retired, wasn't it? Yeah, but I was, I, I, I still went through with the fight and then I came to the, with the exhibition. I still, and uh, Spencer Brown, who, <coughs> who arranged it um, from Gold from um, Gold Star, um, he told me to pull out because I'd got, col- got got a cold as well. Yeah. And I wouldn't pull out. I said, no way, I pulling out. I said, oh, yeah. I said, no chance. And then when Nigel had been come out blasting, he said, I've had of the, you know, he tried to knock me out. But, you know, me being a true professional that I am, I just carried it, carried it through and just kept sticking my jab in his face. Yeah. And he ended up on the floor himself because he threw a punch himself that, that wild. Yeah. You know, and um, he had to read the book to find out. Yeah, that must have felt good though, hadn't he? Yeah, because I just walked by, I just sit him on the floor and I looked, but looked. You know, but I, all I was thinking about, I just want, want this over yeah. because, like, I was drinking and drugging it up to it as well. Do you know what I mean? And then, you know, I wore in the right frame of mind to be in the boxing ring. Yeah. With somebody like him, especially. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But um, I'm glad I did it. You know what I mean? And uh, nobody ever put me down like that. You know what I mean? Nobody could knock me out. Yeah. I was one of them guys. What You couldn't be knocked out. You had to, you know, like, you know. Is that something you can train, the durability? Or is that something well, you've got? Um, so it's like off your jeans, ain't it, really? You, you can either take a punch or you can't. Yeah. But, you know, I used to train my neck and, and, and train my core and stuff like that. But I was I was known for my toughness. That's why I could I could just do, you know, take punches and stuff like that. I could train with anybody and I could take the best shots. Yeah. And I was, I was able to do that. It's just something that I think that's passed down to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, what would you say was your career highlight? Um, there's this this I don't, I, I like being on BBC One. That was a, one of the ones that was really good. Like, yeah. You know, being on national TV, and I think that 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 the it should be back on terrestrial television. That yeah, boxing should. should be back on terrestrial television instead of being on all the different Sky channels, because you get more of an household name. Yeah. So for me, being on BBC One was the best thing because you know you get more recognition. Because everybody's got BBC One and everybody's got Central, everybody ITV, where not everybody's got Sky yeah. Sports, Danza Boxing, or all the other channels and stuff like that. So yeah. being on, being on, 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 you know, BBC One was a, probably the highlight for me. And did you find yourself getting noticed a lot? You, well, it that? was just everywhere you went. You know what I mean? Everywhere you went, and you know, it was it was great, great feelings. My first taste at it, really. You know. Yeah. But then I went on Sky Sports a lot of times after that. But it, obviously, it's not the same. 
has been on BBC One. Yeah. You know I mean? And being interviewed by Ali Carpenter as well was a big thing because of the thing where he got with Frank Bruno. Because yeah. he was like, you know what I mean, Addy? Yeah. And all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you fought on a couple of Frank Bruno bills, didn't you? Yeah, I've boxed on Frank Bruno's uh, shows twice at the NEC in Birmingham in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. That was, that was a great um, great experience. I knocked the first kid out in in first minute. Yeah. And then I won on points on the next one. And you talk about... The Wolverhampton Civic Hall being like that's like your home, wasn't it? That was where you, yeah, I you loved felt the best. I loved the Civic Hall. I had eight professional fights there, and um, I always won there. And I don't believe I'd ever lost a fight there. Really? It just just had a good feeling for me while I was when I was there. You yeah. know what I mean? I liked that's more one of my bucket list venues to play. But yeah. I think they've closed it now. Yeah. I think they've uh, they've had a load of trouble with it. But but yeah. So in your your career was hampered massively by alcohol use, wasn't it? Yeah. So, what's that feeling of addiction like? That and, and knowing that it was an addiction more than just going. Should we go and have a pint after after you've been in the gym? Well, the way it started, but I was just a, just a social drinker, and then I got into a binge drinker, then I got into a problem drinker, and then I come into an alcoholic. Um, nobody sets out to be an alcoholic, but it, like I said earlier on, it comes of keeping on drinking. But uh, I I just I, I enjoyed it. It was part of part of what I did yeah. and I enjoyed you know going to the after parties and I enjoyed the nightlife everywhere I went and so I used to think when I was going these sparring jobs I used to go around the towns and that and go in all the clubs and everything I used to think I was on my holidays and that then I've got to get up and get to spar with the world champion it's <laughs> oh, mad isn't it? you just think with everybody else don't they? they've got a bad angle they've got to go to work the next yeah. day it's sitting at their office Desk but it was my job, wasn't it? It yeah, was my job. Was, you know but, I mean? but none of the other fighters who was come to camp or they did, they they live like me. They 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 done things right like you're supposed to. But me, I, I could get away with it. Yeah, I mean that's good because of you know I was I was just tough and strong. So uh, as the addiction kind of spiraled out, spiraled out of control, it starts dragging in other elements of your life, doesn't it? So your your relationships start falling apart mm-hmm. and everything's becoming a problem and I suppose people aren't wanting to know who are they. They're, they're, this this man that's been on BBC and Sky Sports that should be celebrated, people are going, hang on, let's not get involved with this guy. Mm, well, you go from being a local hero to being um, a local drunk. That's what happened to me, to be honest. Um, I was on the back page of my newspapers for all my boxing stuff and then I was on the front page for my drinking. Yeah. Um, and my marriage um, to June, I was with June... <coughs> Um, my wife from the age of 12 so I was, you know I was with June like um, you know 30 years and um, that was really hard um, to lose that as well um, and being estranged from my children and everything else and it just it just comes with all the hand in hand of alcohol is the great remover of everything yeah um, alcohol and drugs and um, they remove everything they remove all the good people out of your life and everything else um, yeah that was tough that was really really tough to have to take to you know, to be, to be um, one minute a hero, then the next minute not. Yeah, mm. I can. Yeah, I can only imagine. It, it just it, it goes really dark in the book, and I'm not gonna not gonna spoil it for anyone because it, it's a fascinating read. And I think it, it's the kind of thing it would be an amazing film if that mm. if that would ever come come to happen because it, it's just it it's almost it seems like a Hollywood story. It doesn't feel like a, a real life book, especially for for someone that's so local to around here, but. Yeah, to to be kind of keep being dragged in. Was it just something that you just felt like you could never get away from? It just kept on calling for you. Well, any addict will tell you. Um, you know, you, you you just keep you just keep on. You just you know you just could do without it. You know, and they went hand in hand. And they, I used to try and keep off the alcohol and just take drugs. You know, yeah. or, or or stay off the alcohol and just one without the other. Yeah. But I but I never I never could. You know what I mean? I, you know, sometimes I'd just take cocaine and stay off the drink. Or yeah. sometimes I'd just have a drink and try and... But it wouldn't, no, I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Or speed or ease or MDMA or stuff like that. You know what I mean? Was you just... It, it, it didn't matter. You just put it in your body. Yeah, there was I'd no... just take it through because I just wanted to a different feeling. You know what I mean? I always wanted to, to have... You know, I was always looking for that bit extra. And is it escape from something? Is it trying yeah, to get out of your head? Yeah, it must have been, yeah. When I look back now. Yeah. You know I mean, you know, when I look back now... Um, I always wanted to, and I'd always got to do more than anybody else. I'd always, you know, I'd, like, you know, I'd put whole grams of cocaine out and sniff the whole gram and then, and then snort tequila. You know what I mean? <laughs> snort like tequila? That. Yeah, you know oh. what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, I was, it was just 
crazy life that I live. Yeah, I mean, it almost doesn't seem real. Like in in the book, there's some of the, I can't remember the amount of times that you were saying, like you were at double figures of pints of beer. Like mm. I'm a three pints of beer and I'm gone mm. kind of guy. Whereas you just you can drink it like water, I suppose, and just keep on. Um, I just keep just going. keep giving, like. But like I said, when I was when it got to the stage where I was the one I was full in it, it was just pain. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was just pain, you know. Um, it got to that stage uh, where it was just horrendous. And every time I had a drink, it was like a breakdown because the drink had lasted either for a month yeah. or two weeks. And I used to, the only way I could stop then was when my body physically used to stop me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I physically couldn't take another drink. And that's that's what happened. That's the only way I used to stop. And at this point, everything starts breaking down, and your body doesn't. And yeah, yeah. And and you're reliant on your body for your for your job, aren't you? To, to be fighting. Yeah, everything. And then it's you can have a, a granite chin and and be solid to the body, but if your kidneys and your liver start breaking down, it's your brain. Eh? You could put you you could do anything. I mean, you, you know, I used to be, I used to be, um, when I'd be on a, you know, a really bad, really really bad, obviously, because when you get older, you couldn't do it. I used to get older, you could do it. You know what I mean? You could, you could, um, when you're younger, you can get away with it so much. But as I got older, and as the, as the, as the talons of addiction got in deeper and deeper, um, and then it started to get worse and worse, and then the years was going by as well. Because when you get older, it all gets worse as well. And then I was more of an addict and alcoholic as I got older. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? When I was younger, I was so bad, I could do both a bit. You know what I mean? Because I was younger. Yeah, yeah. As I got older, it started to get worse and worse for me. So when did you know that and acknowledge that it was an addiction and that you'd got a problem? Was, oh, there, was, was there a time or an incident that was, triggered? I was like that. I knew I'd got a problem with it when I was like um, still boxing. Right. You know what I mean? But I just to think it, I, I can control it. You know, I can do both. You know what I mean? That's, that's the truth. I just used to think I, I can do both. But obviously, I'd, 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 I'd just try and stop. You know what I mean? I just used to do both and just carried on with it. Yeah, because you were... You were Trying to get off it and go into AA meetings while still drinking, weren't you? And you were still like fighting it. Yeah. You're trying to save yourself, but also still kind of dabbling your toe mm. in alcoholism. Yeah, yeah. So was was there a straw that broke the camel's back that was like that's it? Well, no. Uh, well, when I when, when I end up in prison and things like that, and when you start getting into fights and that, you know, when I was stabbed and stuff and a lot of violence and all that, I had as well, you know. Um, there was lots and lots of violence as well, to be honest, um, and stuff. And I used to keep saying, oh, that's it, I've had enough now, I'm going to stop. Um, you know, police stations all the time, stuff like that, smashing your car up, you know, losing your licence, all, all all sorts of things. You know what I mean? Getting stabbed was another one, like I said. And um, you just say, I'm going to pack this in, I'm going to pack this lifestyle in, I'm going to stop doing this. Yeah. But uh, I never did, you know, I never did. Yeah. So, can we talk about uh, Dr. Angela? Is that okay? Mm. Because she's this influence that comes into your life mm. that is almost like a, an angel to you. She, she, she turns, bit like, you, religion saved you, but she seems like a massive catalyst she for, for dragging angel. you out I, of... I believe God put her in my life. I yeah. wouldn't be sitting here today. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And she sounds like a, a fascinating woman that's, that really helped put you really, back on the it, on the right path. It really is. It really is. I owe a lot to her, to be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? She's amazing. I wouldn't have made it without her, but I believe God works through people, yeah. which he does. Yeah. Um, and uh, it helped, helped me so much. Yeah. You know, a couple, I had a couple of near-death experiences where they, they pulled me out of. Yeah. You know, and uh, showed her love and uh, had me back all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Never, never once... Doubted or left me or anything, because you you must have been an awful person to be around at that point. It yeah. must have not been. Yeah, any, I, I any wasn't fun. nice either. You know what I mean? I wasn't nice. I was aggressive as well. Yeah, you know what I mean, I remember the, the one time. Yeah, we was in Bulgaria and I was quite aggressive and I was after fighting a big Russian bloke. He was about six foot ten. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, we've, we've had a few 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 things. Yeah, I, I wasn't nice to be around, to be honest. But it stuck by me because I knew that I was a good. I got a good art, and I knew I'd come through it. Yeah, anyway. yeah. So, and she used because uh, she's a holistic therapist. Is that the yeah. right? Is yeah. that the right term? Yeah. Uh, she used those treatments to help cleanse your body, really, didn't she? Mm. And, and break down that 
the, the toxins mm. inside of you. Mm. But ultimately, there's only so many times you can be repaired mm. until you you can finally mm. give it up. Mm. So what was the thing that put you back on that path and was like, right, I'm done. I'm going to now change my life. Well, I kept trying and trying and trying. And then, um, you know, and I tried, like I said, I tried to commit suicide and Angela found me and I ended up in the hospital. And now, when the crisis team come to me um, and said there's people in here with worse problems than you, I just went back out and started drinking. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I just started drinking because that's how much resentment I had, you know. Um, and now in such in a bad place I had. And then I was always going to start again and start again. But, like, <sighs> when you're in such a bad place, how do you start again? Yeah. How do you start again? You know, how do you stop? How do you start? How, you know, I, you know, I just... I, you know, I'm really, really blessed and lucky to be here today because it was horrendous, to be honest. It was horrendous. So a, a massive changing point in your life was was finding religion, wasn't it? And being, and like you, you, you said with Jimmy Tibbs, he said that, that God had be there for you. Yeah. When did you start opening your eyes to, to religion? Well... Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life, to be honest, because they said you've got to be willing to go to any lengths and you need to find a higher power. Yeah. And when I first heard that in my first few meetings, I thought, that's a joke, that's not, not, not for me. Yeah. But um, as time went on, I kept struggling. and I was just willing to try anything, you know, and, I, and it was like a last resort for me where I should have had it the first resort. Yeah. And I wouldn't have had to go, th- had to go through so much pain of, of losing everything and trying, nearly lost my life and everything else as well. But if I'd have gone to that first, you know, I'd have been all right. But uh, I had to go through all the pain. It was the last resort. Now, what does people say in today in these days? Please, God, help me when they need him. Yeah. You know what I mean? But God's always there. God's always there for all of us. Yeah. We trust that away from him. You know, I was I was one of them. What was away from him? But he was always there for me. And uh, I should have done that first instead of the last. Yeah. You know I mean? And you said you had this moment where you, you called out to him, didn't you? You called out to God and... Saying, please help me. I, I, I've got nothing else. I need, I need your help. Mm. And you, you feel like he answered you, and he, he come to save you, didn't he? Yeah, I had. Um, I cried out. I was on my hands and knees, and I cried out, and um, he did answer my prayer. Um, I remember once I was doing my twelve steps of uh, recovery with my sponsor, and um, I was writing an inventory down of all the people that had harmed, and all the people that had hurt. And, um, and I felt the presence of God go through my body. I had a spiritual awakening. And uh, it was like a europhic feeling go through my body. And it was like, wow, what was that? And my sponsor seen it. He said, God's just touched you. I said, how do you know? He said, i seen it. No way. Yeah, honest. And he said, yeah, i seen it. And he said, God's just forgiven you for all the bad things that you've done. And uh, I never wanted... To, I, when I dropped on my hands and knees, it was on the 28th of October, 2015. And I never had a drink since. That was it then? I never had another drink since. And do you do you think that'll be forever now? Yeah, I have got no desire to. I think he's totally removed it. When I asked God to remove my addictions, that's what he did. And was that that moment you felt that wash over you? I just, I just, you know, I look back since I've never wanted. I said, God, if you, if you, I said, if you take my addictions away from me, I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Yeah. And um, and from that day, I ain't wanted to drink since. So how long are you sober now? Uh, six years. Congratulations. That's, yeah, I don't get any. I don't. So most alcoholics, you know, I've talked in recovery groups and stuff like that. Um. And they all still had to keep working for it. I don't have to work at it. Mine's totally removed. So if you were to to walk into a pub now, how how were you around? Drink? I don't bother me one bit. Really? I've been on cruises, I've been everywhere, you know, and people say, Don't you get the age for a drink hand? And I say no. And I couldn't I couldn't go a day. Yeah. I couldn't go an hour. You know what I mean? When, yeah. when I was like, when in my, in my, in my madness, I couldn't go a minute. You know what I mean, if I was asleep, that was the only time I wore drinking. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's the truth. Yeah. And that has been totally removed because God removed it for me. I mean, and that, that, that I do it. It's taken by my works. Yeah. I do do it. I do do it because I've done 90 meetings in 90 days. I still tried all that. I did all them. I did all the stuff. I, did. I was in AA for years, but uh, I still kept struggling and struggling. But as soon as I got my heart right and got on my hands and knees and, 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 and asked God to remove my addiction, that is what he did. And anybody's listening to it, it's there for you as well. It's yeah. free. It don't cost nothing. All you've got to do is believe and receive. 
do you believe that everybody can have that euphoric moment of God washing over them and he can visit them and, and actually... Yeah, I do, yeah, because, be, because the Bible says, Romans ten thirteen, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But a lot of people, they call on the Lord, and their heart ain't right. Yeah. You know what I mean, I called on the Lord and my heart was right. He knew I meant it when I said I'll follow you for the rest of my life, which is like what I'm doing now. Like, well, I've got a ministry and I'll go around the country talking and do what I do because he knew I, I meant it. Yeah. You know what I mean, where people think they're trying to backslide or they've they still got one foot in, one foot out, all the, all the down meanie. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he knew I meant it. And that was the only reason why he, why he set me free. But, he, but anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells you that. Yeah. But it's whether your heart's right or your motives are right. Because you'd had moments before, hadn't you, that... You were you felt like you were at the end that you couldn't take anymore. You'd had suicide attempts. Yeah, yeah. You'd had different accidents and different fights and and relationship breakdown, but he hadn't come to you then. So that time must have been right where he finally come to you. Yeah, sorted you out, and that's it. Then it's just a light bulb's on, and yeah. you you free of it. Yeah, that that feeling the day after just must be amazing. That okay, I can start again now. Yeah, it was um, the first. I think. I think, even though I don't have a drink, but I think um, my brain and my head wasn't right for two years. It took me two years to heal in my, in my mind because of the drink, the amount of drink and drugs that I'd done. I mean, I used to do a thousand pound a day on crack. Jesus. You know what I mean, and uh, and I used to, um, you know, I blew hundred and fifty grand in like that in that time oh, wow. on crack, and I used to buy everybody else's crack as well and all sorts of stuff. You know what I mean? And like the damage what I'd actually done to my brain, to my head. But you know what? I never wanted to drink. God kept it, kept it, kept me. Just, just I never, you know, because with an alcoholic, the first drink is what does the damage. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's either the hundredth drink. It's the first one because once your body's crossed over, it it it, it, chem, it release it releases a chemical called acetone, mm. and that cause and that makes you cause stop. But I never, had, I never, never had the desire to take the first drink. God kept me from me. And and you feel like that's it now. You that's can, it. I'd, you know, I'll 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 be true to my way till the day I die. I shall never have another drink. I'll never, I'll never, I'll, I'll never go back. Because when I said to God, I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Yeah, he knew I meant it, and he knew I meant it, and that's and that's all I'm, what I'm all about now. You must feel for the people though that that still walking, that can't walk into pubs. There, there is people now that can't even look yeah, at I, a drink. Yeah, I've, I've been to Teen Challenge. I've been to loads of rehabs, and I, and I speak to people, I sponsor people, and they're they're struggling. They're struggling, and I will say, get what I've got, get what I've got, get what I've got. It's free. You know what I mean? All you got to do is get your heart right and ask him. And you, and you get, you know, it's free for everybody. God, they just saved me. God has no favourites. Yeah, you know what I mean. We're all the same in His eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean. We're all equal. Yeah. But uh, He they saved me because I was a boxer. Because yeah, he, the only reason He saved me because my heart was right. He knew I meant it, and that's the same. He does that for everybody else. Yeah. So if anybody's listening to this with addiction problems or anything else, get on your knees and ask God and get your heart right, and He'll yeah. deliver you. Good. So how do you feel now? Do you feel like your body's... Re- you, you, yeah, but I'm stronger now than I've ever been, to yeah. be honest. I'm in my mind and my body, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good place. Good. Uh, I've got nothing missing in my life. Um, God supplies all my needs. And uh, I'm just keeping on doing what I'm doing. And I've never been so happy. Because there was always something missing, even though I had loads and loads of money. It wasn't ever enough. No amount of drink was never enough. No amount of drugs was ever enough. No amount of sex was ever enough. No, nothing could ever f- fulfil it. But that gap, what I what it was always yearning for, has been filled by the love of God, Jesus. So you could say that this addictive personality that's carried you throughout your entire life has now transpired into religion. Well, yeah, well, it, it's see, I've I've been addicted to all sorts of things. You know what I mean? And um, but being really be, being addicted to God, caught out, is the only is the only addiction what caught out you. Only, yeah. only only benefit you. Yeah, and that's how you spend your time now, isn't it? So you you still. Do your training and you still yeah, do yeah. boxing, but ultimately your job now is to go and spread the word of God and yeah. to save people like yourself that need that help. Yeah. Well, when people see a tough bloke like me, you know, and they see that I'm preaching Jesus, they know there's something in it. Yeah. Now, now I can reach people who people who like you know just a normal vicar from a church and they go into a prison. They ain't gonna listen to him, but I'll go into a prison. They listen to me. You know what I mean? And I yeah. can reach people like that. But I mean, I say that that vicar yeah he could reach people, but he'll reach people in his path. You know what I mean? But with me, I can reach the people who other people call reach. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's why I believe I was saved. You know what I mean? To reach them sort of people because, you know, I've reached so many and um and I'll just keep on keep on doing everything I'm called to do. Yeah. You know, and I will and I will keep and I will I will keep keeping on doing what I'm doing. Because I really enjoy doing what I'm doing as well. It gives me a purpose. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was always selfish and I couldn't get enough myself. 
you know, you know, was I never cared about anybody or nobody or nothing, and now I care about people. God's changed me all heart. He's changed me all life. You know what I mean? I've, I've um, I got baptised on the 15th of uh, November 2015 and uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18 says the old has gone, the new is here, I'm a new creation yeah. and that is exactly what is it, being born again is all about. Yeah. Um, so have you got any advice to, if, if someone was listening to this or knows somebody that is at the absolute rock bottom, whether that's addiction in whatever kind, mm. you believe that we could all be saved and we can all, yeah, we can all get without, we, without a doubt what advice would you give to to that person where do they start at finding a light well we're all different see what works for one does always work for another but you know god's always there it's just i'm away from him you know what i mean i was always too far away or too selfish or too any anybody's got any problems in life don't matter what it is take gotta be drink take gotta be drugs god's always there to help you you know what I mean? You know, it don't matter what it is. Take got to be drink. Like I said, God's there for every one of us. Every single he created us in His image. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it. You know, it's us. It's us that go away from Him. You know what I mean? And the uh, the sin separates us from God. Our sinful nature separates us from God. You know. So if you just, you know, get Him in your life and live to how He wants you to live, you might you want you want you want, you want to a winner. Yeah. You know. So what what do you do now? So you you've got your own ministry. Is that right? Yeah, I've got a ministry. Well, I go around the country talking. I've been on Christian television. I've been on Revelation TV. I've been on TBN. It was seen by three million three million people in the UK and wow. aired in one hundred and seventy countries on both stations. Yeah. I've just had um, a, a, um, an offer to go on God TV, which is just as big as well for the new year. Yeah. Um, and, and and God's just opening loads of doors of opportunities for me. I go around the country speaking and reaching people. Um, Doing loads of podcasts, doing loads of stuff, and I reach. And you know what? I've had hundreds and hundreds of messages through social media and everything else, and I answer every single one. I don't think I'm too big to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because somebody reaching out to somebody, you know, I was saved for that purpose, and I answer every single one. You know what I mean? I don't think I got time for that. Yeah. I answer every single one. But you never know if someone, if that person is reaching out and, and they, they've seen your story and go. Well, if you can do it, the, yeah, yeah. the the lengths because there's a lot of people that are addicted that haven't got anything in the bank that they're at mm. absolute zero. Mm. So the fact that you were able to get out of it when you got the means to be able to constantly buy drink and drugs, mm. that if that if they can speak to you, if you can save one person, it's all worth it, isn't it? Well, I've 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 done more than that. I've saved hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. You know, hundreds of people. I never turn. It's like it's, it's like you know. You you, you 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 get the wisdom of God in you. You know what I mean. You got the spirit. You got the Holy Spirit in you. And like God, don't turn none of us away, does He? So I call turn nobody away. Yeah. Anybody who, who calls on the name of the Lord, like I said, shall be saved. But if anybody comes up to me and they're crying out and they definitely need help, I'll, I'll try and help them and I'll speak to them. Yeah. And I'll give them, you know, and I'll say, this is what I did. This is what I did. You know, we'll try and you know just try your best. Yeah. You know what I mean, but you, you don't have to be an alcoholic or anything else. So you can have a great life. But I tell you now, you could be better if you've got God in you. Yeah, you know what I mean. You'd recommend it to anyone. Anyone who I got to have, have any addictions, who I got to have anything. If if you if you if you can have a good life, you think well, I'm I'm all right. I've got everything. If you ain't got God in your life, you ain't got nothing. Yeah, that's why I, that's that's my views anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean. So where did the idea come to write a book? Um, the the book came about as self therapy. Um, Doctor Angela Quinn, my partner, and um, I was so broken, so addicted. Um, it's like psych- psychology. Uh, to start writing some names, I never intended to write a book. It just come out, just yeah. just come. But I believe the book was, you know, already predestined yeah. by God in what it's achieving today. Uh, it's only I just started, it was only th- only started as writing notes out therapy. Writ- that book's written with a pen and paper. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's, it's a good story that I wrote it with a pen and paper, and it's yeah, do- yeah. it's doing what it is. You know, I did, you know, I got um, got it put on Microsoft Word, and then I sent the book off on email to different publishers and every single one of them wanted it I've offered me a deal it's amazing mm. and it is a, it's a it's a fascinating read I'm not a, a big reader by any stretch but I, I like the fact that I can tell you've written it do you know what I mean mm. there, there's no yeah. ghost writer and I bet if you go to any supermarket now and buy a book there's not many books that are written by they're all written by ghost writers aren't they? and it's authentic. It loses something then because we yeah. can all put fancy words in place and yeah. use it to describe and paint this beautiful picture. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is you was at rock bottom mm. as well as the the highs of your career. Mm. But when you've been sat at the bottom and I can read your actual words of this is where I was at and then 
this light pulled me out, whether that was God or whether that was Angela or whatever it was that pulled you out and, and brought you to where you are today, you can read that word for word. Mm-hmm. And you, you've said that there's a lot that you've had to leave out of the book just because of how, how dark it was. Yeah, there's a lot Well, I've had to leave out. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bad things that I, I can't put in, to be honest. Yeah. Um, um, but there's still a lot in, to be fair. There's still a lot of... Uh, yeah, I know. But, it, you know, there's a lot of things I'm ashamed of as well. But I know God's forgiven me anyway. Yeah. I won't be, won't be, won't be uh, sitting here today, yeah. um, clean and sober. But uh, I did do some quite bad things. Uh, I'm not, ashamed, I'm ashamed of them. But like I said, I'm a new creation today, and I've, I've been washed clean. You know. And how do you feel about regrets? Do you do you believe in regrets? Do you, do you have regrets? Well, I I got no regrets to be honest, because I won't be like that I am today, would I? Mm. If I'd have been a world champion, or if I'd have done this, or I'd have done that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like I am today. So it's no good looking back, is yeah. it really? Um, you know, I wouldn't be like I am today. So I, I got no regrets, to be honest. I just, you know, I regret, you know, um, like you know, my marriage break up and stuff like that. But it was already, you know, if if you just follow God, it's just, you know, it just it's predestined and stuff like that. So know. do you believe in fate? Yeah, I believe I was called to do this. Like I said, like Jimmy Tibbs said years ago. Yeah. And he said he said to me, you're the leader of men. He says, God will use you one day. And I laughed at him. But 30 years later, I, I, I met up with him and he said, what did I tell you? Yeah. You know, and uh, there you go. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's it's really interesting. So where can people buy your book from? Um, the book's on Amazon. Or you can get it for Austin McCauley um, Publishers. Um, you know, most bookshops, Waterstones or anywhere else like that. Um, yeah. It's it's yeah it's 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 doing all right. And we'll have the audio book version coming mm. soon as well, which people mm. if they're not it's, keen yeah. on reading, they'll yeah, be able it's on, to. It's on Kindle as well. As well. It's on, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, so, what do you make of of boxing now? So, in in twenty twenty one, what what's your opinion of it? Um, I don't think it's as good as what it was years ago. No. You know what I mean? I mean, the olden days, the one out strength and conditioning, they used to fight a lot longer rounds. Yeah. You know what I mean? All it's all these fancy stuff and all this just you know. They just used to, do them, you know, they just used to do the, the training, you know, and there's a lot better fighters back in the day than what they am today. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what I think anyway. Yeah. Could you, do you think you could be a boxer nowadays? I'd be a lot, a lot, a lot more successful in the, era, the, the era today. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, even the heavyweight division, you know what I mean? The heavyweight division, they ain't like there was years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean, the middleweights, the Aglers and the Eubanks and Benz and all them, like they ain't, nobody, not, nobody like that about now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, you know, especially heavyweight champions of the world, when you look at, like, you know, Ali's and, and Marcianos and Lennox Lewis and Holyfield and Tyson yeah. and all them, like, there's nothing like that about now. Yeah, them look super giants now. They're yeah. huge, aren't they? Yeah, you look yeah. at Tyson Fury, he's yeah. like six foot yeah. nine. Yeah. And then you've got uh, others, they're all, yeah. like, super, super heavyweights now. It's not, like, just big men. It's, like, yeah. they're, they're larger than life I mean, people. Lennox Lewis was a big guy, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, but he was... You know, he's very skillful as well. He did, yeah. he did wipe the floor with all these lot today. And who's who's the best of all time in your opinion? Um, I don't know, there's a few that I like to be honest, but you got to you got to look at Ali, ain't you? Really, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, he's one of them anyway. Yeah, you know what I mean, you know, especially heavyweight, and then, and then you got you got like sh- you know Sugar Ray Leonard, sh- um, Sugar Ray Robinson, and stuff like that. You know, Floyd Mayweather's done well as well. You know, because you know. It's your own opinion, ain't it, really? Yeah. You know what I mean? Have you got... Uh, was there ever a dream fight that you wanted to be in that didn't happen? If you could have picked one fight for your career, yeah, what would that have been and, and where um, would you have had it? Not really. I never... I never... I never, had, I, I never really had anybody I looked up to either. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I used to like watching Tony Simpson um, when I was younger because of his left hook, chap from Leicester. But I never really, like, used to think, I wished I was... That. Yeah, I, mean, I never, I never was in awe of anybody, to be honest. Yeah, so if you could have fought, because let's say the Civic Hall, that was your favourite place. Mm. If you could have fought for a world title at the Civic Hall, mm. out of the main, the main bunch, who would you have liked to have fought? Could you have had Chris Eubank? I would have liked to fight Eubank. Or, that would have been huge, wouldn't it? That. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere, anybody in the top, anything around the top, it's all publicity and the and the and the, the things what go with it, like. Yeah. You know what I mean? But um, you know. And you're still doing bits of training now. You've you've trained some fighters. Yeah, I've had. I've still been boxing all my life. You know what I mean. I still 
trying myself, trying fighters and stuff like that. But I might, I might be looking to get me a community centre what's boxing based yeah. and a bit of faith in that as well. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. I'm going to... I'm not trying to become a pastor as well. I'm looking at doing some stuff at that with like, uh, and that'll, that'll open doors for the community centre and stuff. Yeah. So you know, and I will just keep on pushing on with ministry, like I said. And I'm yeah. gonna do, you know, like just do everything I'm called to do. To be honest, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. The future looks good. Yeah, good. Um, and because he's not here, I'm gonna embarrass Josh. And I don't think a lot of people know that Josh had a fight. Yeah, he did. And I, I was the only person there that he, he knew outside of his family. And I, I sat there by myself, and you were in his corner yeah. for that. Mm. What was that like? Well, Josh is such a, a nice lad, and uh, he just said, I want to fight. And um, and I trained him for about 14, 15 weeks, I think. Um, and he did he. But when he was here in the dressing room waiting to go out, he, he says, oh, I don't feel, I don't realise it was going <laughs> to feel, feel, feel like this, you know. But um, you only ever had the one. Yeah. But a lot of people do that, like with like what color fights. They just they just want to want one fight just to see what it's like. Yeah. Um, some carry it on, some don't. But um, Josh done really well. You yeah. Know, just to walk to the ring is enough. Yeah. Because when you're standing in that dressing room waiting to go out, you think, what have I let myself in for? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because some don't get it. They do all the training and that. But when you're actually in the dressing room waiting to go out to fight, that's when it sinks in. You think, yeah. what have I let myself in for? Yeah. I mean, it's a very lonely sport, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I remember watching Josh. Because we've obviously, I've played on stage with Josh hundreds yeah, of times, yeah. but we always walk on together. Yeah. And you're always there's always four or five other lads there yeah. that you're there as a team. Yeah, you wear with boxing, you're by yourself, <laughs> and that's yeah. a lonely walk. Yeah, I remember yeah. he he walked out to I don't even know who chose his music, but he walked out to Soldier Boy, which is yeah. just the least Josh song I've ever heard. Mm. And he, he walked up, he got his long hair tied into a ponytail. And he was just the complete opposite of anybody else there. <laughs> and uh, he took to, and one of the funniest things, he liked me saying it, but he got his ponytail punched out yeah. and he come to the corner and they were, you'd got to put his hair back I in the bobble. put his hair back in with and the elastic I, band. <laughs> and, and you don't seem like the kind of bloke that's put many many men's hair I in ain't, bobbles. I ain't, it's the first one I've ever done. <laughs> I've, tr- I've been in the corner hundreds of thousands of times and I've had to put it in somebody's hair right. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Just you could have done with that uh, Malinagi moment. We just chop it all off in the in the corner, <laughs> but it was funny. But it, he got the win to be fair, and he yeah. he did really good. I remember yeah. him coming to practice, and he he'd been training. His hands were all swollen, and he's got his nose on the other side of his face. He's a good looking lad. And then we yeah. got we got a gig on Friday. You got you, you've got a black <laughs> eye. You got blood coming down your nose. What are you doing? But now he he enjoyed it. But, done well, man. But yeah, I think he, he's probably quite glad that there's no footage out there of him. Of him doing it, but he does get a mention in the book, so that's another reason for anyone that's from the studio to uh, mm. to check that out. Um, right, so before we finish, I did pre warn you. I got one philosophical question. I think I think I know the answer, but I'm I'm interested to get your take. So I do this question at the end of every podcast. So let's imagine I've got a hundred balls in a bag here. Each ball is worth a hundred grand. There's one ball in there that ends your life instantly. You can take how many balls that you want. How many would you take? Uh, so you've got 99 chances mm. of getting £100,000. Mm. Or there's one that just finishes it all. I'll take none. That's what I thought you'd say. Mm. What is that? Because I wouldn't risk it. Yeah. Mm. Because I, I I put the question in, because I, I asked this question to Josh. Mm. and uh, But I, I thought, because you've been from a position of having money, mm. and then... It's not relevant, is it? When you're at the bottom, mm. it, it can't bring you no, everything. Can money it? don't buy happiness or bring you happiness as well. It's just a, it's just a tool that we need to live. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get my happiness in God and yeah. everything else. God supplies all my needs. Yeah. Um, but money's a root to all evil. To be honest, is that is that what you? Yeah, think? I think it is. Yeah, Bible says it's a root to all evil. Yeah. Um, and 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 it is. Because what people do for money, they'll rob banks, they'll kill, they'll murder, you know, they'll do all sorts. You know what I mean? And it, and it just stay right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because money's de- deceitful. People lie, they cheat, they rip people off, you know, and all stuff, sort of stuff like that. But when you ain't got money as your god, you're peaceful. Yeah. You know I mean? Brilliant. That's a great answer. So where can people find you online if they want to see more of your stuff? Um, just Facebook, Instagram. You know, yeah. um, I don't like I said. If anybody sends me a message or anybody uh, wants to sign copy of my book, they're going to send me a message as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if they so search for Andy Flute, yeah, and I'll, I'll, find s- I'll send them a copy. Some people, co- you know, they they'd soon have a signed copy. Yeah. They don't want to buy it just straight from Amazon. You know what I mean? 
because they want me to sign it or put best wishes or put a little yeah. note in it, like you know what I mean, just because they bought it for so and so, they bought it for this, they bought it for that. Yeah. And I've had, I've had, I've had so many like people saying that the books achieve what I wanted it to do. I had a mother um, contact me and they bought the son, but the son was involved with drinking and drugs and he was in a bad place and he bought the book and he set him free. Yeah, amazing. Because there's a prayer at the back of the book. Um, what you can say if you if you really want what I've got, yeah, you know what I mean. And there's you know if anybody wants to get free, everything's in that book. And just follow the instructions. What's in there? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I'd really recommend it. I think anyone. Well, if you're interested in your boxing, yeah, if you're interested in religion, I mean, just to have just to have, you know, and there's people who have said I call thank you enough. I've read this book and it's just changed my life. You know, and yeah. uh, you know, it's just it's just there. You know what I mean? It's just there for anybody what what, what wants to help. If you really want. To get out of any addiction or anything, you know what I mean. That's the answer. Yeah, you know, I mean? the, you know the answer's there. You know what I mean. Yeah, no, I'd, I fully recommend checking that out. But yeah, thank you for your time today. It's been really interesting chat. Of uh, I'm over the moon to have done it. But yeah, appreciate that, and uh, hopefully we'll catch you again soon. So I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on.